Well, losses usually uh, the expenses in a, in essence of gambling. If you were a professional gambler, then it might be on a Schedule C. It should be a business, possibly. We talked about that idea. But if you're not like a professional gambler, then uh, you would you would think it's going to be a, a hobby type of situation. In which case, the income not subject mainly to self-employment income, which is nice, might still have to be taxable. And the expenses then you can't typically deduct, but uh, you can't typically deduct as like business expenses, but possibly on the Schedule A, as we can see here. The losses that you're allowed to deduct, however, only be going up to the amount of income that, uh, that you receive. So you have that kind of limitation. And you can only take the losses if you're a fairly, fairly well-off individual or at least one that owns a home typically because that's the thing that's going to be pushing you over to the itemized deduction. So if you're a poor person gambling, then you get no benefit for the losses and you still have to report the winnings. But if you at least own a home, then you might be able to take some of uh, the losses with relation to gambling. What does this do in practice? Well, it, you might have questions about people, should I, should I try to record all of my losses and whatnot and keep track of them? And, the, and generally the idea, well, that's kind of a pain to do, but if you are itemizing, then you might want to do that because if you have winnings, you're going to have to report them and then you might get the benefit of the losses up to those winnings. The losses being something that isn't reported to the IRS. The IRS doesn't have that information. Uh, however, in the event of an audit, they're going to want to see it, right? So if you won you know, a $100,000 car and then you wrote off losses of 100000 on the Schedule A, then the IRS is not going to have that documentation to verify it, but, the but they might audit you on it, right? And they'd be like, well, where's the losses that you wrote off up to that, you know, $100,000 car? You would need then the documentation would be the general idea. Okay. Casualty and theft losses of income producing property uh, from form 4684, line 32 and line 38B or form 4797, line 18A. So we talked a little bit about the casualty and theft losses. For more information related to those, we can look at the instructions for the form uh, 4684. And then we have the federal estate tax uh, on income in respect of decedent. Now, estate taxes in general get into a whole nother world of tax planning and preparation and once again are usually involved on the more higher income side of things, remembering that the income tax, the federal government in the United States typically gets most of its money from the federal income uh, tax. So we have an income tax type of system, meaning they're going to try to tax people when they earn the money. They're not taxing people after the money is already in their bank account because that would be a wealth tax. They tax the money before it gets into uh, the bank account. But for some more wealthy individuals, generally, you're going to have the tax on the balance sheet on what's in the bank account or more, more accurately what the holdings are or the value of an estate. So they have to, once someone dies, the death tax, the estate tax, value the estate, and then basically uh, apply the tax. And then you get into some complex relationships sometimes between like the income tax and uh, the estate tax. So again, that usually is going to come into play for more well-off individuals, in which case you, you might be getting into the world of estate tax planning, which is tied together with gift taxes and of course with the income tax. So a deduction for an amortizable bond premium, for example, a deduction allowed for bond premium carry, for, uh, carry forward or a deduction for amortizable bond premium on bonds acquired before October 23rd, 1986. Now, this is also something that's somewhat more unusual for most people because when most people invest, they're going to be investing in stocks and bonds, but often done through like a retirement plan, like an IRA or a 401k plan, typically not investing in stocks and bonds directly, but using tools, mechanisms such as mutual funds and uh, ETFs, in which case you might not run into this kind of, uh, of uh, situation, but you, have, you might have some traders that are purchasing and selling bonds, and then you get them to, to the idea of 
amortizing the bond premium. And that's when you can get into the weeds uh, more on that specific situation.